Uh, welcome everyone to this SIWEM event, uh, Upscaling Rewilding and Tree Recovery through the Rewilding Network. Um, it's part of the SIWEM Climate, Land and Water Management Digital Series, and it's being hosted today by the SIWEM Southwest Branch, um, and we've got Sarah King here. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just moving on to the next slide, um, I'll go through some initial housekeeping. Um, so, as mentioned, this webinar will be recorded and like uh, all of our other previous recent web webinars, they'll be saved on the YouTube, on the SIWEM uh, YouTube webpage. Um, so we do have a, a really good catalogue um, of previous webinars, so you can, um, yeah, you can uh, peruse at will. Um, as has just been mentioned and, and popped up, we've got a Q&A and chat function, so please note that they are discrete. And um, so, uh, yeah, feel free to post any questions uh, that you have throughout uh, the webinar into the Q&A and we'll, uh, we'll pick them up at the end of the session. And um, if you do have any technical issues, then pop them in the chat and uh, we'll, we'll try to get those sorted as, a, as quickly as we can. Um, this webinar does contribute to CPD. It's one hour, but as mentioned, we do not provide CPD certificates. Um, so before we start, take the time to have a health and safety moment. So SIWEM in 2019 declared a climate and uh, ecological emergency. So we have a responsibility as a, as a professional organisation to our members to, to advocate for exemplary environment and sustainability uh, management. And as part of that, I want to highlight a couple of um, couple of uh, key, I guess, events. Um, but it's a bit more than that, really. So, uh, on Saturday, twenty second of May, just gone, there was the International Day of Biological Diversity, and twenty twenty one to twenty thirty is the UN Decade of Biological Diversity. So, two really uh, key overarching. Um, events really, both recent and ongoing. And um, so the International Day of Bi Biological Diversity was uh, proclaimed on 22nd of May by the United Nations to increase understanding and awareness of biodiversity issues. Um, the slogan, we're part of the solution, was chosen to be a continuation of the momentum generated last year under the overarching theme, our solutions are in nature. The second point, the UN Decade of Biological Diversity 2021 to 2030 uh, is focusing around ecosystem restoration uh, and it's a rallying call for the protection and revival of ecosystems all, all over the world for the benefit of people and for nature. It aims to halt the degradation of ecosystems and restore them to achieve global goals. So the UN decade, as mentioned, runs from 2021 through to 2030, and it's also the deadline for the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which are ending in 2030. Um, and it's the timeline that scientists have identified as the last chance to prevent catastrophic climate change. Um, just to touch on a couple of points from a more local perspective. So this is being held by the Southern Southwestern Branch. We hold a number of events and we've got several in the pipeline. So do uh, keep abreast of the SIWEM events page and uh, email will be coming out as well. In terms of the Southwest branch, we've got the AGM on the 10th of June. Uh, it's a virtual AGM and there's still plenty of time to register. So if you're interested in, excuse me, if you're interested in the process itself or if you want to put your hat forward, um, to one of our vacancies, then yeah, please do register. It'll be great to see you there. You can meet other members of the committee. Um, we do have a South LinkedIn page as well, which I think Barbara will kindly put up into the chat. So again, feel free to, to join uh, and to be able to converse with other members. On a, a larger large scale, so Cyber has inevitably uh, made the transition increasingly so given COVID to the virtual world um, and we're able to reach a global audience now which is fantastic really um, and we're able to provide relevant events and community working so that's, that's great to see. Um, 
we have, as mentioned, declared a climate and ecological emergency declaration, and there's a couple of key events I think people will be aware of COP26 26 being held in Glasgow this year, I think it's 1st to 12th of November. And um, there is also COP15, which in Kunming, China, which is the 11th to 24th of October 2021. So I think they are new dates. Um, in terms of SIWOM events and activities, as mentioned, we've got the SIWOM events page. So that is regularly updated with a real diversity of events. Um, from all over all over the UK, really. So do take a look. Um, something else to highlight, actually. So we've got the Let's Talk WEM, Water Environmental Management podcast by our president, uh, Nikki Roach. And we've got a key date in the diary, which is the 28th of June uh, to the 1st of July, 2021, which is the Flooding Coast Conference and Expo. So I think that has been a pretty comprehensive introduction in terms of the uh, rest we can't hear you. Okay. Um, is that better? Can you hear me better now? That's better. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so yeah, thanks for that, Barbara. And um, so, yeah, I would like to introduce Sarah King from Rewilding Britain. Um, very, very lucky to have Sarah here today. Um, can you just bear with me? So, so Sarah is the Rewilding Network Lead at Rewilding Britain. She is spearheading the development and project management of the network using her over 10 years industry experience as an ecologist. Her background spans rewilding, biodiversity monitoring and assessment, species introductions, land management and restoration plans. Specific projects have included beaver reintroductions and rewilding in the Southwest to show the benefit of this ecosystem engineer. So yeah, a huge wealth of uh, your practical knowledge that um, we're really lucky to be able to, um, to listen to today. So uh, thanks, Sarah. Thanks for that. And um, thank you for the excellent introduction that I think has probably built me up further than it should have done. But um, yeah, welcome everyone. And thank you for coming along this evening. Um, I'm Sarah King. I joined Reward in Britain in June last year um, with the main aim to help to set up and establish the rewilding network. Um, so as, as Naresh said, I've got an ecology background, um, mostly been building my career really through ecological consultancy and more traditional survey work and working with developers and all sorts of different projects. Um, and then about five years ago, started to get introduced to, actually probably more than five years ago, started to get introduced to rewilding. And really it changed my perspective of how we should maybe look at our landscapes and how we should look at some of the ecosystems and habitats that we work with. Um, so hopefully tonight's presentation will give you a really quick taster about what rewilding is and how it's being applied across Britain. Um, so firstly, I just want to start with something um, that I think visualises quite well how complex nature is. Um, it is really difficult to pull one thread or one strand of nature and not have everything else coming along with it. Um, everything is interconnected. And if anyone on this call hasn't watched Serengeti Rules, the documentary or read the book, I would highly recommend it because as soon as you start to think about any element of nature, you realize how interconnected everything is. Um, you know, our uplands all the way through to our streams and our rivers and our lowlands and all of the different components that are part of it. And in Britain, we have got really deplete, depleted ecosystems. We're missing a lot of these keystone species. And as a result, we're seeing much simplified habitats and ecosystems within our landscapes. And what this usually means is that we're then seeing degradation of wildlife and um, different processes. And, and this degradation is, is then affecting the abundance of those species. So we know that we're in an ecological crisis. We also have the climate emergency. Um, and we need to appreciate how complex nature is and maybe we need to let it have a little bit of space and freedom to show us that complexity going forward. So I don't really need to tell this audience um, 
too much about rewilding. I'm sure you've all heard of it and that's why you're here. Um, but we're just going to go through what we as an organisation at Rewilding Britain see rewilding as. So rewilding is the large scale restoration of ecosystems to the point where nature can take care of itself. And this is something that I actually find quite exciting because um, you have this unknown element to it. You have all these different approaches depending on where you are in the country. Um, but it's also a little bit scary because you have to step back and, and not develop a, a prescriptive management strategy for a project, but start to really delve into what are the natural processes that are present what natural processes might be absent and what do I need to do to repair this ecosystem to allow nature to then take care of itself going forwards. So at Rewilding Britain we have an approach that is to set out a clear set of principles uh, whilst having a significant degree of flexibility at the local le level to allow these surprising extraordinary and unpredictable events to emerge as nature starts to take care of itself and we have five main principles of rewilding so we know that we need scale for nature to really be allowed to rewild and to allow natural processes to take over so there's no getting away from the fact that we do need to start looking at larger scale areas when we're rewilding that's not to say you can't help rewild at smaller scales, but we need to acknowledge that really we are working at the landscape scale to allow natural processes to function. We also, as I've already mentioned, uh, one of our principles is letting nature lead. Nature can lead the way, it can show us a whole surprising number of outcomes. So we really need to allow nature to have that space to show us how those natural processes exist within the landscape. And our three other principles um, might be a surprise to some people, but they're very much including people and people are very much part of rewilding landscapes. It's not just a case of shutting the gate and walking away. This is not land abandonment. This is people working within those environments and working alongside nature. So we have creating resilient nature-based economies as one of our principles. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more further down the talk about that. We're also looking at supporting people and nature together and building community engagement and community involvement in with these rewilding landscapes. And also securing benefits for the long term. A lot of the time when we're looking at landscape scale change, we're maybe just only focusing on the short and medium term, especially when we're looking at funding windows. But really, we need to start looking in the long term when we're looking at rewilding and what is going to be the long term change within these landscapes especially when we start thinking about the climate emergency um, alongside that to add another layer of complexity. So I've already mentioned that with rewilding, we're looking at scale. We also look at reduced uh, management intensity. So this is a really um, simplified diagram that starts to show the difference between rewilding projects and maybe some of the typical nature reserves that we see. So on this diagram, you'll see in the top left hand corner, there's quite a lot of green dots on there. That's to indicate the sort of size that most of our UK nature reserves are at and also the level of management intensity. So because these nature reserves are protecting really high quality priority habitats, they tend to have very prescriptive high intensity management requirements to make sure that we're protecting those priorities, priority habitats and priority species. And a lot of the time they're very outcome focused. Whereas the rewilding projects that we start to see, which are the lighter blue dots that you'll see in the bottom left hand corner, are areas where maybe we have less management intensity. We're re repairing those natural processes. We're allowing nature to lead. And then the aim is to then increase the project size so that you can then really start to look at this landscape scale approach. You can really let natural processes lead the way. And the darker dots on this um, diagram is just showing some of the international rewilding projects. So you'll see that a lot of the mainland Europe rewilding projects are quite high up that acreage. And this gives them that space to allow natural processes to really lead the way. But when we talk about rewilding and we talk about rewilding in Britain, we are calling for 30% of Britain to be in rewilding by 2030. And that splits down into 5% of really core cool rewilding. So these fantastic areas where we really let nature and natural processes lead the way. And then 25% of other nature recovery uses. So things like uh, regenerative processes, hay meadows, grazing, 
um, things that still support nature recovery and still on this rewilding spectrum, but aren't necessarily the core areas. And that's something that we're calling for as an organisation to really create this mosaic of different habitats and approaches within our landscape. So I've just provided some examples here of some of the different rewilding projects that we see in Britain. And really what I wanted to try and uh, show through this slide is that really there is a kaleidoscope of different approaches to rewilding. It's not an off the shelf product. It's not a one size fits all. It's very much dependent on local conditions and what natural processes you have there. And I think for me, this actually gets really exciting because you will then be able to start to travel through the Southwest and through the rest of Britain and start to see the different local characteristics from the heathlands down in the Purbex to the grasslands and scrubland and wood pasture of Nep, all the way up to the highlands of Scotland um, and through to our marine and our coastal environments. And I think rewilding really gives us that opportunity to take away some of the monotony that we see in our landscapes and really start to showcase these cultural and local differences. And we can start to then bring in different animals as well. So there are some grazing animals on this slide and they've been brought in as proxies for our missing wild herbivores. But you can start to use native breeds to also reinforce some of those um, local characteristics. Um, and I think that's something that rewilding can really bring is that it can bring back an identity to that area as well as bringing back the wildlife and the support. So we've got a whole range of different approaches here in some areas up in the Scottish Highlands um, that they need to start tree planting because there isn't a natural seed source there. There are also heathlands where maybe there's some grazing that's needed to mimic that natural process on the site um, through to coastal ecosystems where salt marshes are being restored and then that natural processes are allowed to dominate these areas through again mimicking natural grazing. So we're not really seeing the same approach everywhere and that that's what makes it exciting but it also makes it quite difficult to establish a rewilding strategy for your project. Um, and just to reinforce why we need to think about rewilding, I've mentioned the climate emergency before. Um, we released a report um, end of last year looking at the impact of the climate emergency on our wildlife and one of the stark reminders of why this is so important is that it's estimated that with the changing climate in the UK um, animals and wildlife are likely to have to move northwards at a rate of five kilometers per year which is stark and we don't have the infrastructure in our landscapes at the moment that we don't have those wildlife corridors that will allow a lot of those species to move north when they need to, to with the changing climate. And so we really are at a stage now where we're coming into the UN decade of ecosystem restoration. Now is the time to act. We know how to do it. And I think um, there is that increasing movement of people looking at rewilding as one of the opportunities for this. So I'm just going to talk about the benefits of uh, rewilding. Um, we've been doing, as an organisation, we've been doing quite a lot of work to try and gather some of the evidence around how rewilding can benefit us. Um, and I, again, I don't want to make this a doom and gloom talk, but it's important to remember that the UK is ranked 189th out of 218 countries for biodiversity intactness. So I think it's about time we turn that around and that can be the success story for this country to really move up those ranks. Um, and I think we definitely can do it. So the benefits of rewilding um, with an increase in vegetation, soil health, the mosaic of habitats and in our landscapes that we see from rewilding has started to show that it can draw down carbon from the atmosphere. And we know that there are these nature-based solutions that will help to draw down, but also to store carbon. Um, and not only in the terrestrial habitats, of course, but in, in the marine environments as well. We recently released a report with uh, Marine Conservation Society um, looking at the impact of blue carbon and how that can also help to store um, carbon from being released into our atmosphere. Rewilding, um, as I've mentioned just now, can also help wildlife to adapt to climate change. We have to face that our climate is changing in this country and we need to build in that resilience to our habitats and to our landscapes to really make sure that wildlife can adapt can move through the landscape as, as is required through things like nature recovery networks. 
We know that rewilding can reverse biodiversity loss. I'll talk about some of the example projects in a minute on the network, um, but really not only have we seen rarer species coming back, but an increase in abundance. Um, and really we can use this as a technique and an opportunity to really start to put nature recovery back into our landscapes rather than the endless um, biodiversity loss that we're seeing. Um, it does support diversifies nature-based economies. I'll talk about that in the research we've been doing in a little bit more detail in a minute. And we also, I think through COVID lockdowns, all know how important natural areas are to our health and well-being. And not just open spaces in urban areas, but really going out and being in some exciting rewilding projects makes all the difference to mental health, well-being and physical health as well. So as I mentioned, uh, we are building the evidence base for rewilding and we're using the network to provide this evidence base. Uh, we recently compiled some analysis of, I think it was about 23 sites across England. And this showed that looking at the jobs before rewilding and after rewilding, we saw a 47% increase in full-time equivalent jobs. Not only were we getting more jobs, but those jobs were very diverse from ecotourism, wildlife guides, um, artisan enterprises. We got a full diversity of jobs that were being created by rewilding projects. And that hopefully then not only supports jobs within local communities, but brings in a diversity of, of different people as well to those areas and a different skill set. We also saw a ninefold increase in volunteering opportunities. Um, volunteers were coming to help with fencing, be volunteer wardens, um, tree planting. And again, these are opportunities for local communities to get involved, but also to enjoy those areas and get the, the health and well-being benefits from those. And of course, citizen science and monitoring is a really important part of rewilding as well. And it just helps to improve that education and awareness of what our landscapes could look like. And also really importantly, um, we get asked a lot of the time about food production with rewilding. All of the sites that we looked at still supported grazing animals. Um, they just tended to support slightly different grazing animals. And every single project that were in this sample across England was still producing food. Um, they were also on low agricultural classification uh, land. So it was, they weren't particularly productive for food either, but they were still producing food whilst rewilding their landscapes. So I think this is really important to, to bear in mind when you're thinking about rewilding landscapes, because it's not about abandoning them and just leaving them to nature, but people are very much part of this and there are great opportunities for green jobs and um, resilient jobs um, going forward. And this is just, again, some pictures of some of the diversity of enterprises that we've started to see through rewilding projects. Uh, wildlife watching in the marine, um, wildlife safaris in terrestrial areas. We've got food production. We've also got gin production coming through from a lot of the rewilding projects. So this whole range of different um, crafts and, and artisan food production as well. We also see a, an increase in visitors and education and school visits are so important to get children from all backgrounds into these areas and really start to show them how nature works and get really hands on. And then land management jobs um, are also very much a part of projects. Uh, the photo down in the bottom right is from a rewilding project in the Lake District, where there's still traditional land management techniques that are needed, such as repairing dry stone walls. So you can really start to see that not only through rewilding, we can see a diversity of wildlife and habitats within these landscapes, but also a diversity of opportunities for people as well. So I've kind of already spoken about what we do, um, but just in case anyone isn't aware of Rewilding Britain, we're, we're a small and dynamic team. Um, and the aim of what we do is we try to catalyze rewilding through providing advice, content, resources, we influence policy and we deliver campaigns. So we've got a campaign coming up shortly looking at wild and national parks. So keep an eye out for that. And we also engage people in what rewilding is and tell the stories of how rewilding can be applied on the ground. So before I move on to talking about the rewilding network, just want to make it clear that as an organization, we don't um, own any land. We don't directly um, manage any projects on the ground. We're very much a case of uh, we help to facilitate. So the rewilding network, as it's got set up, has got a whole range of independent rewilding projects who we've engaged with, we provide advice to, 
we've assessed them to make sure they meet our rewarding principles. But this allows us to stay quite dynamic and to really um, look at where we can put our resources to best use for the projects on the ground. So uh, this is just to give you a taster of, I've, I've already really spoken about what we want to achieve as part of the rewarding network, but really the, the aim of the network um, when I started was to try and help to propel rewarding to a whole new level, to provide a really practical resource for landowners, land managers, project managers, to be able to look at their site, find guides, find practical advice, and also find peer-to-peer -peer learning so that we can all start to see rewarding as a serious option for, for a whole range of different projects and to start to share some of those success stories so that we can all start to see um, a healthier landscape in the future. So if anyone um, hasn't been on, on the website, this is just a screenshot of um, what our rewarding network map looks like. Um, it's really early days. We only launched this map in uh, January, February this year. So we've still got a way to go. And I'm sure there's still some rewarding projects that are missing from this map. Um, and hopefully as the network and the community grows, we can start to grow this map and really start to showcase all the diversity of exciting rewarding projects that are happening across Britain. But as you can see already, we've got a whole range of different approaches. Um, the green pins on the map are the rewarding projects that, that have joined the network. Um, and the blue pins are local networks that are being established to help to coordinate more local action at the county level. And the really exciting part about the rewarding network is not only showcasing all those different approaches, but bringing all that knowledge into one place um, to help with peer to peer learning, to create a supportive community and to really start to show what rewarding in our landscapes could look like. So I'm just going to run through some of the projects um, just to give you a bit of a taster at the national level what projects we have and then I'm going to go through some of them in the southwest a little bit more so that you can start to see what rewarding projects we have around here. Um, so generally the rewarding network has quite a mix of private estates, private land holdings, but also NGOs and partnerships. So we work quite closely with the Wildlife Trust um, and also with the likes of the RSPB and the National Trust on their rewarding projects as well. Um, but this project um, is up in Scotland, it's in southern Scotland. Um, it's a project that um, started in 2000, so it's been going for just over 20 years now. Um, and the slightly barren looking picture that you've got in here is, is kind of an example of what it looked like before all the tree planting was done. Um, the group um, brought managed to crowdfund to um, buy the valley and buy the site. Um, and then they've been encouraging volunteers to go out and plant thousands and thousands of trees. And that's because we're looking at before it started rewarding pretty much a treeless valley, there wasn't a natural seed source. Um, so deer needed to be excluded through fencing and tree planting needed to be done to restore the seed source and to restore forests um, to this valley. Um, so this is a really exciting project that's been going for a long time now. Um, it's been written about quite a lot um, and Border Forest Trust are working to expand it through a couple more projects um, to really start to show how the Scottish high, well, the Scottish lowlands in Southern Scotland could look um, through re rewilding. Next, we're heading back down to England to a project that I'm sure lots of people on this call are familiar with. Um, but it's really important to refer back to the NEP estate, uh, which is one of the pioneering projects of rewarding um, in Britain and certainly in lowland England. Um, so the NEP estate started rewarding, I think it was in 2000, I think they've been rewarding for about 20 years now. Um, and they went from an arable farm um, and a dairy farm to deciding to rewild. And this is a uh, low production farmland. Um, so they weren't getting much of a crop off the land. They weren't being very profitable. So they looked at a different approach to it. And it's really started to lead the way on what our lowland wood pasture habitats could look like. It started to give examples of how herbivores can be used as proxies. So they've got longhorn cattle on the site, Tamworth pigs, Exmoor ponies, as well as deer. And they've taken down all the internal fencing to allow these animals to move through the landscape. And essentially what that is doing is mimicking how natural herbivores, so elk, bison, aurochs, 
um, and all sorts of other herbal and wild boar would normally move through the landscape and they're mimicking that with these native breeds um, to start to kickstart those natural processes and to show us how these dynamic mosaic habitats look. And it really has started to pay off, especially in the last five years. They've seen cuckoos come back, purple emperor butterflies, um, nightingales, turtle doves, as well as a whole abundance of common species, common species to really show how uh, these habitats can recover biodiversity and recover nature. And last year they reintroduced white stork as well. And I think I heard recently that they had about uh, I can't remember the exact numbers, but thousands and thousands of visitors last year to come and see the white stork that are then helping to keep uh, in increasing jobs and enterprises on the site through the safari, through the campsite and all the other enterprises that they have. So it really is an important project to show how some of our lowlands could look. And of course, this isn't going to be suitable everywhere, but where we've got low production farmland or marginal areas, this provides an opportunity to restore nature and create quite an exciting landscape at the same time. If there are any Springwatch uh, fans on the call, um, you might recognise Wild Kent Hill in Norfolk. This is a medium scale project um, that has joined the network um, and they are doing a really interesting approach actually because they have got um, an area of their land allocated for rewilding. They've also got an area for regenerative agriculture and they've got an area of traditional conservation um, coastal management. So it's really exciting to see how this can create that patchwork approach where we've got these core rewilding areas surrounded by nature recovery areas and the wildlife within the core rewilding areas can then spill out into these other areas. But you're really create, creating this diversity of habitats that can accommodate a, a whole range of different species with their different niches. Um, so Wild Ken Hill is a great example of how you can incorporate rewilding in amongst other land uses um, for wildlife as well as for people. So it's early stages with Wild Ken Hill, but they've also just started their safari visits as a new enterprise and income stream for the site. And they've also got beavers there in an enclosure. Through to the coast, so we're working with Marine Conservation Society to try and develop um, what rewilding could look like in a marine context. So we are working with them and other partners in the coming months to really start to develop the marine rewilding principles. Um, but Wallasey Island in Essex is one of the coastal rewilding projects that we have on the network. Um, the island was created from spoil from the Crossrail project. Um, and has created coastal protection habitats as well as priority habitats such as salt marshes um, to create really great opportunities for a whole range of different wildlife. Um, and after that initial capital works restoration, um, they now have a plan for the project that will allow natural processes to dominate, mimic natural grazing regimes and really start to encourage this succession of different habitats and the constant movement and change of habitats within the project. And finally, through to marine, I've said we're doing some work at the moment on marine rewilding. Um, this is a project up in Scotland where the local community um, decided to get fully engaged with creating a no take zone um, off the coast of Arran. And since they've done that, the seagrass has been restored, the oysters have come back, the lobsters, the scallops, the octopus have all returned from this no take zone. Um, and it really is a success story of how our marine environments can rewild within a fairly short period of time. This project started, um, I think, 20 years ago um, and how community engagement can come in and start to um, give that power to local communities to say, we want to have a different approach to our marine environments. We want to restore seagrass and these important habitats. And this has also created new enterprises. So scuba diving, tourism, They've got a visitor centre there and the area around the no take zone also benefits from fishing uh, and increased fish stocks. Um, so really then the local fishermen are also benefiting from this rewilding project. So we're doing some work, as I said, with Marine Conservation Society to start to see if we can expand this out and really start to encourage other projects um, in the marine environment um, to build on the fantastic work that's already being done. So that's just kind of a few examples from from Britain as a whole, but this is the Southwest um, 
event. So I'm going to just go through some of the Southwest examples. Um, as you can see, it's still fairly sparse, so I'm sure we can do some work to build up on uh, the projects that we have in the Southwest, but there's also some really exciting projects that are happening. So uh, coastal, we've got a lot of coastline in the Southwest and the Sea Up Marshes are um, is a project of managed realignment, again, where quite a lot of capital works and restoration and, and breaches to the sea wall have happened to create these priority salt marsh habitats. But now the project is looking at restoring natural processes at the same time. So they're bringing in longhorn cattle in low numbers. They're replacing the sheep grazing with cattle grazing to really mimic these natural processes and these varying grazing regimes um, and, and encouraging natural succession of these areas. So it's not outcome focused. They don't have a strict management plan for the project. Um, and the rewarding areas are allowed to have natural processes leading. And we know that there's a benefit to the local community from the coastal protection um, and the community was engaged in this project as well. So it's a great example of how rewarding can come in to benefit people and to deliver ecosystem services, as well as enhancing biodiversity. Down into Devon, um, Upcock Grange Farm or Rewarding Coombs Head, as it's also known, is a rewarding project um, medium scale where they are restoring natural processes through bringing in, uh, we've got heck cattle here, uh, ponies, um, they've also got wild boar on the site. The project is also um, a centre of excellence for breeding. So they are breeding wild cats on that site. Um, they're also breeding lynx um, and beavers um, are on that site as well to help to then use these in, in reintroduction projects that are coming through. Um, so it's a fantastic opportunity and this year they've also just started doing safaris and walking tours and camping. So again another enterprise that has come into this project that provides job opportunities and income. We also look at the smaller scale. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that you really do need scale to allow natural processes to dominate. But as I said, that doesn't mean you can't look at the smaller scale. Um, and we also have projects on the network that are dealing at smaller scales, um, like the Sharpen Estate down in Devon. Now, they've just, I think they've just left now, but they've just brought woolly pigs in. So you can see the really cute picture in, in this slide of the pigs that have come in. They have brought a couple of pigs in. They've had them within one area for 21 days, which has allowed them to create the disturbance and to um, kickstart those natural processes. But they don't have enough space to have the pigs on there all year round. So the pigs have now moved off um, and probably moved on to another site. So they can now watch and see the impact that, that those pigs have had on the ground and start to see the natural succession and the natural natural processes coming through. Um, the Sharpen Estate also do a lot of work engaging people, they do a lot of training there, engaging young people. So it's a really exciting project to show that you can still rewild at smaller scales um, and they are also looking to help to develop the Devon Rewilding Network to link up to other people. Over to Dorset, um, there's quite a few projects that are emerging in Dorset, but one of the largest ones is the Purbeck Heaths National Nature Reserve. Um, this is a project that's quite exciting, actually, because at the moment they're working on whether they can join up with different land holdings and different landowners with this super nature reserve to then share grazing. So they're hoping to try and create um, a contiguous uh, area where grazers can then move through that landscape naturally. And this will be one of the first um, of its kind where not only have we got landowners working together, but you'll have animals being able to move across land holdings. So that really is starting to mimic those natural behaviors of herbivores and how we would originally have seen them moving through the landscape, uh, munching on meadows in one place and then break, pushing down trees in another and creating this real mosaic of different things that are happening. Um, so that's one to watch out for, and they've got a real diversity of different heathlands, woodlands, grasslands and wetlands down there. Um, so it's a really exciting um, mosaic approach. Other examples that aren't on the network, but are also really, really important. Uh, we um, know that the National Trust are doing some great work in North Somerset. Um, the Honicott State has got 
beavers on the site now uh, within an enclosure. They're also doing a lot of natural flood management work there, as well as um, stage zero river restoration, which is reconnecting the river with the floodplain. I'd probably put that in more of the kind of traditional restoration approach, but starting to then mimic natural processes in the future, they might be able to create some core rewilding areas there. And we can see that, that not only is that beneficial to biodiversity, but it also reduces the flood peak down and saves millions of pounds of assets from flooding. Um, so really important to look at not only the impact that rewilding can have on biodiversity, but also the ecosystem services and the nature-based solutions that it can deliver. Um, and the other example, Exmoor Myers restoration, again, re-wetting of the Myers by blocking drainage ditches can help with flood um, prevention, but is also creating those natural wetlands that we should be seeing there um, and allowing those areas to rewild. So it's really important to consider those ecosystem services alongside um, the biodiversity benefits as well. The other thing we're trying to develop um, as part of the network is local networks and groups. Uh, we've got a few that are emerging in the southwest, Cornwall, Devon and Somerset. Um, and these networks are really trying to help to coordinate local um, rewilding, linking it up to local initiatives, local nature recovery networks and strategies, landscape plans, all sorts of different things. So we're really excited about these local networks becoming established to help to coordinate some of these projects um, and maybe also help to campaign for local action going forwards. So that's a little bit about what we've got at the moment. I just wanted to kind of finalize this talk with looking at the future, uh, having a look at what, what's coming up next for rewilding um, and what should we start to move into. So last week, the government made quite a lot of policy announcements, one of which was um, they were looking at creating a species reintroduction task force. And they mentioned a few different um, animals that they were looking at, so from beavers uh, through to pine martins, as well as wildcats. Um, and the reason why these species are really important is not only because I don't know, they're exciting and they're new and they're charismatic and they bring in tourism, but a lot of these species have a function within our landscape. And when they're missing, we lose that function and we usually end up trying to replicate it. So we know quite a lot about beavers in the southwest. We're lucky enough to have them on the River Otter as well as quite a few other projects. We know that they create great opportunities for biodiversity but they also store a lot of water, they improve water quality, and they are also natural flood managers and ecosystem engineers. Um, so seeing those back into our wild areas is gonna benefit biodiversity, but also people. Um, white stork down at NEP, again, a really charismatic species um, and creating a really nice habitat um, in the NEP estate. Eagles, um, there's a lot of talk about white-tailed eagles being reintroduced um, and other bird species, again, they, they are an apex predator, they form an important role and we are missing their role in our ecosystems at the moment. Pine martins down at the bottom have been known to predate more on gray squirrels than red squirrels, so they help to control the gray squirrel populations. Um, and that can also then benefit natural regeneration as well as other things within that woodland setting. Uh, top left, uh, marine environments. We mustn't forget our marine environments. They are vitally important. And a lot of our marine environments around Britain are severely degraded from bottom trawling as well as other management. Um, so we really, really do need to start looking at rewilding our seas and our oceans, restoring seagrasses, kelp forests, oyster beds, and seeing the impact that that will have on our own fish stocks um, in the future and making sure that those fish stocks are resilient. And finally, I, I need to talk about the lynx, um, one because they're one of my favourites, but also because they are so, there's such an exciting uh, prospect of potentially having lynx back in Britain. Uh, we know that they are ambush predators, they very rarely come into conflict with people, uh, but they also help to control deer numbers. And without these predators, we are seeing extremely high numbers of deer um, and we're having to pay money to control them. So we need to think about restoring some of the complexity back into our ecosystem through these species. And this is just an illustration of what it could look like in the uplands. So um, it's probably a bit of an extreme version. I'm not sure that you would see a, a lynx and a wildcat in the same frame, but it just gives you an example of how what we should be inspiring towards. 
um, we've got this mosaic of, of different habitats within this landscape. You can see the rivers being allowed to have space to braid and to meander and, and to have these pools wherever possible and hopefully have a beaver dam down there as well. Uh, you can see these natural regeneration of woodlands and grasslands and meadows, the species have been restored. But also I'd just like to point you to the, the idea that actually there are people within this landscape and they're working with nature and we still maybe have some farming and grazing that's happening and food production, as well as tourism and, and all sorts of other things. Um, so this is kind of the, the way what we're aspiring to as an organisation, and I think we can certainly achieve it if we put our minds to it. And just really quickly about where the network's going, um, we're developing practical guides. We're using the land app to map different projects, as you can see on this slide, and really then starting to show where the different projects are, how they can link up together, um, and how we can really look at this in the landscape scale. And we're also doing events and peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange to look at practical um, approaches to rewilding. So if anyone wants to find out more, we just uh, launched our new website. Uh, we launched it at the beginning of the year. Um, it's got a whole load of resources on there around exploring rewilding, what it is, what it looks like, what are the key species. Um, you've also got information on there about the rewilding network. So keep an eye on that because we're updating the, the map all the time. Um, and it's just got a whole load of interesting stuff on there and events. Um, and so keep an eye on the website and explore all the resources that we've got on there. And I just challenge everyone on this call uh, to think big and act wild because we do need to look at scale. We do need to think a little bit differently and let's be bold so that we can change how our landscapes look in the next decade um, of ecosystem restoration. Um, so thank you for your time. And uh, yeah, I, I'm opening the floor to questions. Hopefully we've got enough time for questions at the end. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Um, that was a, felt like a real call to action, really inspirational. So um, yeah, it was a pleasure to listen to. Um, I really like the the initial diagram, actually, the fact that everything is connected. Um, I think we're seeing more and more today you know, how, how certain events shape up and how they how the, there is this underlying connection and um, almost like a cascading effect, really. So once you start to affect certain certain aspects, it all as you say, unravel. So, um, yeah, really good perspectives, and also really important. I thought to to highlight the um, the idea of it's not being it's not land abandonment. I think um, you know rewilding is looking to work with work with communities as well, and in the same way that rewilding is trying to look at um, biodiversity and habitat mosaics, but it's also trying to work with and enhance cultural mosaics as well. Mm -hmm all the different communities and all the dis different perspectives so I think it's really important that you know that, that point was made and it's about giving reassurance as well so um, yeah brilliant talk um, mm -hmm. we do have several questions so I will read some of them out um, so first one here uh, rewilding is very trendy with people getting on the bandwagon without naming names what sort of project doesn't constitute rewilding yeah, so one of the things that we're working really hard on is to um, put some more detail on what those rewilding principles look like in practice. So we have created um, an evaluation criteria for the network. So all of the projects that go on the network map get evaluated by us to make sure that they are in line with rewilding principles. Um, and we are doing some work at the moment on what we constitute as being core rewilding. So that 5% core rewilding that we're calling for and then 25% of other rewilding nature recovery initiatives that are on that rewilding spectrum. So we're putting some detail on that at the moment, mainly because there is a lot of um, risk and it's already happening that rewilding is being used in other contexts, is also being used as greenwash um, for some things. Um, so yeah, it's something that we're very aware of. Um, we want to try and acknowledge that rewilding isn't just about wolves and bears and lynx. Um, that's quite high up that rewilding spectrum. Um, and that's obviously the ambition that everyone's aiming for, but that doesn't mean that that's the only approach. And there are gonna be projects, especially in Britain that are never gonna reach that because we don't have natural predators here. So we're trying to look at, okay, what are what is this rewilding spectrum? Or, or we're trying to think of a better term for it. Where are the projects along that? And what barriers are there that will stop them from going further up that rewilding. So it's not just a case of 
this is a rewilding project, it's done, but it's very much a process of moving up that scale um, towards a, a rewilding or a rewilded landscape. Brilliant. Um, so a follow-up question I think was, um, not every project has proceeded according to plan, what can go wrong? Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that's exactly what we're trying to get to with the network itself, is that um, we're seeing a lot of success stories from rewilding projects, especially coming out of NEP at the moment, but that's been 20 years in the making, and there have been things that have gone wrong, and there's been things that are a challenge, like engaging the communities when you've got a whole load of ragwort uh, growing up, or maybe there's a load of invasive species, or uh, a beaver escapes, whatever it is, there are challenges and there are things that go wrong and there's learning. But at the moment, it's quite difficult to access that from the projects that have been innovative and pioneering on the ground. So we are trying to address that as part of the network and bring together some of those learnings for others who are just starting out. But hopefully over this year, we'll start to really draw out some of those stories so that we can show the different approaches and, and what went right as well as what went wrong. I think it's really important to get that to get that perspective. I guess looking at rewilding and looking at the approaches in this sort of long-term way as well is really important because like you say, you're going to get ups and downs, you know, through the project. So you've got to have that sort of you know, perspective of the you know, bigger picture and working towards something. And I guess and it's, it's, that you'll have that. It's really hard because you, the temptation I imagine is to really start to step in, but the idea of rewilding is to really let nature lead. And so you've got to try and balance allowing nature to lead the way and see where it goes, whilst also making sure that you're repairing and restoring that natural process to allow it to function. So mm. it is quite a tricky thing and, and it is very complex. And the more I think I know about rewilding, the more I realise that I don't know and still have a lot to learn. Every day is a school day. Yeah. Um, so another one here. Uh, what would you say is the most important natural process to restore? <laughs> Would it be apex predation, natural water courses, grazing patterns, etc.? I don't think you can. I think going back to my first slide, you can't pull out one thread. It really is looking at the whole system. Mm. Um, and I think there are things that we that we haven't restored yet, such as apex predators that do have a key role. Um, and whilst they're not there, we need to start um, doing that ourselves. So, for example, the NEP estate, um, they harvest cattle um, because there aren't any natural predators there and then they sell the meat um, but I wouldn't say that there is one more important process I think it's very much understanding what processes you have on your land what is already functioning what needs to be maybe have a bit of a helping hand to allow it to function and what is always going to be absent because you don't have natural predators there and, and what you need to do to step in but I wouldn't I wouldn't like to draw one out because rewarding is very much about looking at the system as a whole Great answer, thank you. Um, another question here. Um, da, 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 da. Okay, so in order to help tackle the climate crisis, it is known that a large societal shift to diets much higher in plant-based foods will be necessary. So reducing CO2, methane emissions associated with meat and dairy production. Do you foresee how this will affect, do you foresee that this will affect how and what land is used for food production? and yeah. or see that this will affect suitable rewilding land so i guess that's probably quite quite pertinent is it with the, with the whole uh, farming sector as well and agriculture yeah it's the real time of change at the moment for our land use we've got the environment bill we've got the uh, agricultural bills not just in england but at the devolved nation as well um, we've got elms coming through for england so that's looking more at public goods payments which works quite well with rewilding because you're looking at soil health and water quality and all of those sorts of things. Um, something that there's a couple of things to really bear in mind with rewilding. We don't recommend rewilding as an approach for high, product, high productivity agricultural land. That mm. land should really still be um, used for food production. And there's other opportunities like regenerative agriculture to restore soils in those areas and make sure that food production is sustainable. So all of the projects we have on the network are marginal land um, that doesn't really produce much food anyway um, and I think that's a really important thing to look at secondly I think I don't know what the recent um, totals are but as a as a country we waste about 40 percent of our food so there's a lot of work to do around food waste um, and I think that combined with better agricultural practices that hopefully will come in 
and, and farmers will get paid for those practices through elms, I think is a really important changing point for not only the rewilding areas, um, but also to see how they connect up with other land uses to really start to look at that mosaic across our landscape. So yeah, it's a real time of change. And I think it's a real opportunity for doing things a little bit differently. Great. And talking about doing things a little bit differently uh, comes on quite nicely. So um, does rewilding Britain consider the use of Miyawaki afforestation in very small patches of land within urban areas a form of rewilding? If not, does rewilding, uh, does rewilding Britain consider such urban-based tree planting projects? Yeah, so we don't tend to get too involved with urban rewilding projects, mainly because um, there's always there's already some great people working on that, like Plant Life with their Road Verge campaigns. Uh, the Wildlife Trust are doing great work there, and it is very difficult in an urban environment generally to restore those natural processes because you just don't usually have the scale. Um, that's not to say that we should exclude those at all, and those approaches to those forests and um, different food forests and allotments and all of those fantastic urban projects that are happening really do then contribute to what's happening within the wider countryside and I think seeing again seeing it as a system you've got the urban areas that are being restored for biodiversity linking through to the kind of green belt and the countryside and then through to these rewilding projects I think that's really exciting to be able to then see that the, the movement of animals from those urban areas to the outside and at the moment we don't really see that but I think they're all really important components of restoring biodiversity across our landscapes. Thank you. Um, a project, oh sorry, question here. So how are these projects being financed and what is the biggest block to scaling up rewilding projects? Yeah, so I think there's a few things. Um, we are doing a lot of work on the policy around how um, landowners can get paid for rewilding. So my colleague did a lot of work and is still doing a lot of work with the Elms team to make sure that rewilding gets included in that. Most of the pro so. A lot of the projects are NGO projects, so they get funded through the RSPB um, and through foundations and, and funding applications. But there's also a lot of private estates who are creating new businesses. So it really is a hybrid and, and quite a good blended mix of funding and agricultural payments, but also creating these new private enterprises. Some projects use um, carbon credits, biodiversity net gain credits to um, pay for some of the capital works and then they develop these new enterprises like tourism, camping, um, all sorts of different approaches to then fund those projects going forward. Um, so it really is quite a diversity of different funding streams um, depending on the site and where it is and, and whether they've got they want to bring in safaris or whether they don't want to get involved with tourism. Um, there's different models and approaches. Mm. So you mentioned um, tourism, ecotourism, and you mentioned a couple of other, um, well, a range of other sort of opportunities, I guess, for not just graduates, but, you know, early career professionals and, and, and those who may want to shift careers. What, what do you think or what, what would you really like to see to help that, that? What else do you think needs to happen to help support that, to help sort of grow the rewilding economy and, you know, to help, you know, other individuals um, who are looking to, to work in these areas to actually to sort of seize those opportunities? Yeah, I think rewilding and rewilding projects bring with it a whole new different skill set. Um, so even the projects that we're working on, we're helping to map the projects. So there's GIS input, there's drone operators, so drone surveys of projects, remote sensing is going to be a really important part of monitoring rewilding projects going forward. But then you also get these new skills coming in. So uh, wildlife guides and tourism, um, you've got stockmen and trying to learn traditional land management techniques um, then there's ecology obviously is, is a key part of it as well as all the other advisors so there, there's a whole bunch of different skill sets that I think a rewilding project will need to utilize and I think it gives a lot of different approaches to people who want to get involved with rewilding you know even the rewilding Britain team itself it's not just a whole team of ecologists there's actually not too many ecologists it's only really myself and Alistair the rest of the team are very much looking at kind of enterprise qualifications, um, communications, engagement. Um, so a whole range and diversity of different skill sets can then apply to rewilding. And I think that's what's really exciting about it is that you can bring people from different disciplines and different backgrounds 
into one project team. Um, and I think that's when the magic happens, isn't it? When you're bringing everyone together. So yeah, anyone looking to get into rewilding, um, I'd certainly start looking at skill, developing skills like um, remote sensing, GIS, yeah, maybe tourism, wildlife guiding. And uh, there's also lots of, lots of these projects are looking for volunteers and are looking for people to get out there and help with some of the survey work. So yeah, there should be plenty of opportunities, hopefully for people if they want to get out there and, and uh, experience these sites and, and help out as well. Brilliant, thank you. I think there's probably time for one final question, which we just bring out. Um, so yeah, inspirational answer, thank you. Um, so marine rewilding is hard to imagine given the lack of boundaries in the sea and freedom of species to move in the sea naturally. So does this involve stopping harmful activities in the rewilded area, e.g. extraction, pollution, fishing, dredging, etc.? And how does ownership work here? Yeah, so marine, the reason why we're working with Marine Conservation Society is because it's very different working in the marine environment to terrestrial. And I'm a terrestrial ecologist, so it's quite a steep learning curve for me. Mm. Um, essentially, you the seabed itself is owned by the Crown Estate. Um, but you then have uh, different rights to those areas, so fish, fishing rights and things like that. So most of the marine rewilding projects have to be developed through a partnership approach and through community engagement. And again, going back to this rewilding kind of spectrum, up at the top of that, in a marine environment, you're looking at no-take zones. Um, so removing any extractive um, opportunities there to allow those fish stocks to regenerate. You might also need to get in there and do some seabed restoration if there isn't a seed source or kelp forest restoration or, or reintroduce native oysters if they're not there. And then you, you allow those natural processes to lead the way. Of course, that's when, when we're talking about rewilding, we're not talking about that approach everywhere. We're talking about those core areas across maybe 5%. And then around that, you have these other areas in the spectrum where um, you maybe are doing some fishing, maybe not the most damaging fishing, like the trawling, but there is fishing there. Um, there are other enterprises in those areas. So there's a whole range of different approaches. As I say, we, we are working it out with Marine Conservation Society at the moment, what that looks like. Um, but yeah, real diversity of approaches. And I think the problem with marine environments, and I'm, I'm guilty of this as well, it's very much out of sight, out of mind. So I just assume that our marine environments are great, um, but actually when you start delving into them, they really do need a lot of work to try and help to kickstart those processes and, and allow fish to return to those areas. So, and, and I get really excited about then saying, you know, we, we could have terrestrial rewilding projects in the uplands, um, and then we, they link up to lowland areas through the rivers and streams, and then you've got coastal rewilding that then link through to the marine. And I think when we get to that point, we really are winning then because we can really start to see how these systems are all in, interconnecting. Source to see, and you've got that landscape connectivity then, haven't you? So it's, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, I don't think we've got any more questions, to be honest. Um, but we've had some really good ones that have come in. I guess one, one quick thing that I wanted to, to ask is, uh, as an individual, you know, what can I do around rewilding? You know, mm -hmm. If I want to, to be involved, whether sort of, you know, hands-on or if I want to try and, you know, engage others, then you know, what, what perspectives do you have on that? Yeah, so one of the really easy things to do is sign up to our newsletter because you can hear about all the content. We've got a campaign coming up in June. Um, which is gonna be looking at wild and national parks. So keep an eye out for that um, because that's something that everyone can get involved with. Um, again, keep an eye on the local networks and the local groups that are coming through um, because they're gonna be hopefully involving people um, in some of the exciting projects that they've got going forward. And then just, yeah, keep an eye out for any volunteer opportunities, go and visit these projects, you know, go and see them and feel them and experience them. And um, now that we're starting to build the map, Hopefully it'll make it a little bit easier to see where those projects are and be able to go out and, and see them and then share those experiences with other people and just, just share the message really, because there are still a lot of people who haven't heard of rewilding um, and don't really know anything about it. So yeah, going out and experience it and then and then sharing that message with others is, is really important. Really. Well, thanks, Sarah. Um, thanks for such a, a great talk and for a really comprehensive Q&A as well. Um, yeah, some really, really positive comments from, from people in the chat as well um, and the questions themselves. So, yeah, thanks for, for engaging, engaging Siwa and the membership and, and all the attendees. Um, 